So, good morning. It's a real, uh, real pleasure to uh, uh, to be among you uh, again. We came a day earlier, actually, because of the because of the snow. So, uh, as there was a little kickback of uh, of winter. So, but we uh, we had a good time yesterday with the with the Gagnes, uh, uh yesterday. So we came Friday already. So the kids had a blast playing in the playing in the snow. So. And, and it's a pleasure really to be, uh, to be here again. Like, I, I don't know, Swanton has, a, has got a special place in our hearts. Like, like, you were one of the, one of our, you are, when we, after we came to America, this, you were, I think you were the first church that started to uh, support us here, so which we are very uh, thankful for. And, but we're especially thankful, what, what, what makes me especially thankful and, and really happy to be here because we know you are a praying church and, and, and we, we really know we, we need that and, and that's, uh, that's, I want to say especially uh, thank you uh, for. So today is actually uh, what's on the church calendar called uh, uh, Palm uh, Sunday, right? Because, uh, oh, actually, there's no palms in the passages I'm gonna, gonna read, actually, but like, it was like when a lot of pe- people we know from the other Gospels that the disciples took palms and uh, palm branches and welcomed Je- Jesus into Jerusalem uh, with it. That's why it's, it's a day on which Jesus made his entry uh, into Jerusalem the, the Sunday before he was, he was crucified. So I wanted to, to speak also about what happened when, uh, when Jesus entered Jerusalem. So let me read with you from Luke chapter 19. Let me read the passage with you. Luke chapter 19 starting in verse uh, 28. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany, at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a cold tide, on which no one has ever yet said, Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away and found it, just as he had, as, as he had told them, went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus. And throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. And as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitudes of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King. Who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven. And glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him. Teacher rebuke your disciples. He answered. I tell you. If these were silent. The very stones would cry out. And when he drew near. And saw the city. He wept. Over it saying, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade round you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you, because you did not know the time of your visitation. This is the word 
of the Lord. So I'm happy to, uh, to share the word with you uh, this morning, but when I, was, uh, when I, when I chose the passage for, uh, for this morning, I, thought of, I, I, I came upon, I thought about Luke 19, because I thought it's Palm Sunday, and I was reading it, and I thought, okay, this connects also with, uh, with Jewish ministry. But when I started preparing, and I felt like, well, how shouldn't I have chosen another passage in the end? Because it, it, it felt a bit heavy. Um, shouldn't I have chosen something a bit happier to, uh, to preach on? But I thought, no, let's be, I thought like we ha- let's be faithful. And we don't want to just choose the, the happy uh, f- verses in the Bible. But really want to know what the Bible says, right? And be faithful also when we, uh, when we teach it. Because, like, you know, a lot of Bibles, they put... Above this passage, like, like the, the, the name, like the triumphal entry, right? And that's okay. But especially above verse 41 and 44, I think we could better write the weeping entry, right? Because actually it's, it's strong words actually for weeping that's being used there. It's Jesus is actually, you could say, even could call it the wailing entry because Jesus is crying loud really because it's it's all about a, a deep tragedy that's why I thought like maybe I should should I choose something a little bit bit happier but then I also thought like yeah there's actually a lot to a lot to learn from this passage so bear with me and let, let's get through it and, and let's, let's see what we, can, what we can learn from it. And so th- so uh, I'd like to give the, the title of, uh, of this morning's message, like the, the tragedy which made Jesus, which makes Jesus weep. The tragedy which makes uh, Jesus weep. And let's first look at the, at the setting, and then a closer look at the, at the core of of this tragedy, what, what's going on, what's, what is the real heart of it. And then at, last, at, at the end, like, uh, that there's also fortunately a but and an until to this, to this tragedy here. Because, you know, there, there's all kinds of emotions. If you, if you really let this passage come to you, there's all kinds of emotions in this passage, right? It's quite a contrast, actually, between the, the crowd of the disciples on the one hand, and then, and then Jesus. You know, the, the, the disciples, they really, really beside themselves with joy. They praise God with a loud voice, we read, right? Like, for all the, all the mighty works they they had seen why were they so excited well they're thinking well this is really going to be it this is going to be the the grand finale so to say the climax we've seen a lot but this is going to this kind of top it and why were they thinking that well jesus just had had gotten the donkey right Because Jesus wanted to make his entry in Jerusalem on it. Jesus was actually very, very purposeful in, in doing that. When Jesus did that, he was actually purposefully fulfilling a prophecy. Here, here it is from the book of, book of Zechariah. Let me, let me read it to you. Let's read it together. Like That's what the prophet Zechariah said. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, or or being saved, means God will really help him through. Humble and mounted on a donkey, 
on a colt, the fall of a donkey. Now, the disciples might, they didn't get immediately this link to, the, to this prophecy that the Gospel of John tells us, but they, but they really, really got it that Jesus is making deliberately his entry as a king. And they, and they really get along with that more than, more than enthusiastic, right? This is it, they think. All the miracles they did, they, they promise it's going to be fantastic. You know, the other Gospels, they tell us that, that, they, that they, they shouted Hosanna, right? And that actually means, yes, please save it's like also a cry of excitement. We will have the great break breakthrough now. Luke, he leaves that out. But he gives actually another quote from, from Psalm 118. Because it's actually Hosanna. That actually comes from Psalm 118. Lord, please save us. And he, he, Luke gives another piece from what, of uh, select something else the crowd the, the, of the disciples was saying. For they were chanting. Blessed is he who, who comes in the name of the Lord, the King. And, and you know, the disciples also add to it as we, as we read. Let's go there. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. And they add peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. It's, it's like, especially in their excitement, they seem to be saying like, you know, this is going to be peace. It's, it's going to be amazing. There's no limit to it. Right? Sky is the limit. And glory in the highest. They're really ecstatic there. Uh, some Pharisees who are, are also there in the crowd. They say, ah, this is crossing a line. This goes too far. Teacher, rebuke your disciples. That's what they say. But Jesus doesn't stop it. Because actually, what the disciples and the crowds with them is, is chanting, it's true. It's 100% true. Because Jesus is the Messiah. He is the King. Who brings salvation and, and amazing peace. It's true. So that's the, that's the setting. But then Jesus sees... Jerusalem as he's coming down from the Mount of Olives. And suddenly he burst out in tears. And he says, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. Talking about peace. That what leads to peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. In other words, oh Jerusalem, I wish that you would get it. But you don't. And it will have dreadful, dreadful consequences. For Jesus continues, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you. And surround you and hem you in on every side and they will level you to the ground you and your children within you and they will not leave in you one stone upon another now that's what, what historically also happened 40 years later the zealots took took over in Jerusalem yet the revolt against the against the Romans disastrous results Jerusalem was completely destroyed in the, in the year 70. And then again, 50 years later, you get a second, second revolt against the Romans. Again, disastrous destruction. Dreadful. But that, that Jerusalem chose this mistaken political path, it's, that's only scratching the surface still. Of what makes Jesus weep. And he said, when he wishes that Jerusalem would know 
what makes for peace. Because Jesus points to, to a deeper why, a deeper reason for, for Jerusalem's destruction. Because we say it, he says it also, because you did not know the time of your visitation. The, the, the NIV it gives, the, gives the meaning well when it translated it, it as you, you, you didn't know the time of God's coming to you. Because visitation, that's like a term from the, from the Old Testament. It's about, it's about God's visitation, God coming. And you're missing it, Jesus says. It's a tragedy. I don't know. I mean, imagine you were, we were one of the, one of the disciples there, right? Like, I, I think they, they, they would have been bewildered. What's going on here? Jesus, aren't things going great? Don't you hear the enthusiasm of the crowds? Right? What's wrong? Well, Jesus, he, he knows more and he, he sees deeper. Yeah, the disciples are getting it that, that Jesus is the Messiah, the King of Israel. And he indeed will bring amazing peace. But how does he do it? That's something that disciples aren't getting yet. Yeah, a week later, then they will understand. But not yet. And, Jerus and Jesus also understands that the majority of Jerusalem, in the end, will not get it at all. That's the tragedy. Let, let's get... Let's explore this and let's, let's get a bit deeper into this. Yes, Jesus knew that, uh, that the people wanted to, make him, wanted to make him king. That they were looking for, for a strong leader. There's a worldly, worldly lust for, for a strong leader who will, who will fix things for them. Everything that doesn't sit right with them. Not much change today, right? But Jesus also, also knew that, that, they didn't that they wouldn't like his way. That they wouldn't like the way in which he is a leader. That's not the kind of leader the people wanted. Jesus knows that that the people are not getting it. Why he came, not on a horse, but, but on a donkey, humbly, without pomp and, and circumstance. And there's also this, you know, Jesus is actually quite annoying, actually. He comes all the time with this, with this message of repentance. A message that the kingdom is for those who are, are poor in spirit. And, takes what, and, take, and take what's just happening after this event. It, it must have been a bit of an anti-climax for the crowd. Like a disappointment for the crowd really. They welcomed, welcomed him as, as king. But no, he doesn't start kicking out the bad guys. And they, and they had really bad guys back then. He, he does nothing about it. He only goes to the temple. And he starts to point out what's wrong there. He starts to drive out everybody who sold something there. Saying they made a den of, den of robbers of it. Yeah, Jesus, he knows that, that the people want, want the Messiah who makes everything good for them. A Messiah who gives health 
wealth and prosperity. But not a Messiah who, who puts his finger on, on our sins and calls us to, to repentance. Let's also explore a little bit more what Jesus is saying when he says, you didn't know the, the time of your visitation, Jerusalem. Jesus knows that Jerusalem is not getting it. When actually God is coming to her. You know, John the Baptist, he said it. He was quoting from the, from, from the prophet Isaiah. The voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord. In other, wo in other, wo in other words, the Lord himself is coming. And he came indeed. But he came in the person of Jesus. He came humbly. And not only that, he died a horrible, horrible death on the cross. It is about that that Isaiah again prophesied in Isaiah 53. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Why didn't they see it? Because he grew up before him like a root out of dry ground. And he had no form of majesty that we should look at him. And no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and, and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Jesus knows that the people want a Messiah, but not a seemingly weak, crucified Messiah. Yeah, the Apostle starts to start to preach it in Jerusalem about 50 days later or 60 days later that the cross wasn't the end and that Jesus rose from the dead and that exactly by dying and by coming so humbly Jesus was the arm of the Lord God himself saving us. And with that, the, the message of repentance came again to Jerusalem. But Jesus knew when he came down the Mount of Olives that the majority of the people in the end would not believe this message. That's the tragedy. And it broke Jesus' heart. Jesus was wailing, we even, we even could translate. He knows the dreadful consequences. The, the, the disciples and the crowd, they were, they were shouting ecstatically about peace, right? And they had reason for that. The prophets, they promised a... Uh, a beautiful future for, for Jerusalem. And that's, by the way, still today a good starting point for conversations with, uh, with Jewish people. God's promises to Israel and, and how they will be fulfilled. God promised so much beautiful things, but, but how will they come? Great will be the peace of your children. We read in Isaiah 54, for instance, about Jerusalem. But Jesus sees Jerusalem when he comes down and he says, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. Because before Isaiah 54, where it says, great will be the peace of your children, you have Isaiah 53, where it says the punishment that gives us peace 
was upon him. Upon God's servant, the Messiah. And without recognizing that, there is no peace for Jerusalem. On the contrary, it's a tragedy of missing the sacrifice on the cross. And, and that's a tragedy that, that's unfortunately still going on for many Jewish people. Thousands and thousands around us in, in Brooklyn. Many of them very religious. Just like the Apostle Paul said, they have a, they have a zeal for God. But not according to, to knowledge. They study a lot. Keep a lot of rules. They study also a lot of energizing, mystical teachings. But they, they miss the, the visitation of God. The coming of God in Jesus. It broke Paul's heart. It broke Jesus' heart. Because he knows it will will remain hidden for the eyes of many in Jerusalem. What he came to do. Because of their lack of repentance and faith. But before we talk more about, uh, about the Jewish people, I believe let's, we have to ask first ourselves the question. Are we seeing the things that make for peace? Are we seeing God's coming in Jesus, his visitation? Special way in which Jesus came. Are we getting it? Are we getting the cross? I think that's the core of the tragedy. Because the glory of Jesus, it's, it's, it's a strange glory. It's the glory of the, of the grain that falls in the earth and dies. And which exactly that way bears much fruit. Well, we, we might say, well, you know, that's uh, Sunday school one-on-one. -on -one. Everybody knows it, right? Jesus died for, died for our sins. That's what, uh, that's what the cross means. Maybe we can even put it nicely in, in theological, fancy theological terms. The cross is, it's about substitutionary atonement. And don't get me wrong, because it is. That's 100%, that's 100% true. That's the core of the, of the good news. That Jesus took our place. That he died for us. So our sins could be atoned for. He for, he for you. He for me. That is the good news. But still, are we really getting it? Amazing love. How can it be that you, my king, would die for me? Are we getting it that that was, was necessary? Not just as a thing that we know, like, of course. And are we also getting this, this annoying repentance part, which was part and parcel of Jesus' message? That we have to admit that we are, we are sinners. In deep need of, of God's grace. You know, it means that we can't, can't walk through, the, through this world anymore as, as, su as successful know-it-alls. As people who are morally superior. If we get it. If we get the cross, then, then something has broken in us. Yes, we want and we have to go to others. 
with the good news. That there is no other name than the name of Jesus by, by which we have to be saved. But we bring this message as, as beggars. Who are telling other beggars where you can find the bread. And are we getting the part that, that if it's true that he, that he died for me. That it then takes our, our entire life. That I'm not my own anymore. That we owe everything to him. And that we, that we want to follow him now. That we, we are losing our lives at the cross. You know, Jesus said it. Truly, truly, who believes in me has eternal life. That's the gospel promise. But let's not make that... Let's not make that cheap. As if it's some cheap eternal life insurance. Okay, I did that. I checked that off. Now I can go on with my life. That's not what it is. Yes, he gives us eternal life. Amazing grace. Freely. But then it takes us all now. Then we're losing our life to him. And also to his way of the cross. The style of the cross. I was thinking about it last week as I was preparing it. You know, Jesus would say it uh, a few days later. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. That's about his, his own death in the first place, right? But then he continues. And he immediately applies it also to us. And he says, whoever loses his life, whoever loves his life, loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. Jesus said it clearly. If anyone wants to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. And follow me. That's a package deal with, with getting the cross. We can't live for ourselves anymore. What do we live for? And how do we live? Are we just living a life seeking our own comfort and, and pleasure? Or are we willing to live a life in the service of God and others? And also, even if we, if we go for good causes, how do we go about it? Are we about dominance? Fighting for our rights? Or are we also willing to go the way of the cross? Willing to be a, a faithful minority, maybe. That's quietly assault and a light. It's maybe even persecuted. Are we getting the cross? I'm, I'm asking myself also. Are we getting it the way Jesus went for us? And the consequences that, that it has. And Jesus is in tears as he, as he sees Jerusalem. And, and as he knows that the majority of, of Jerusalem won't get it. It shows there is an urgency in this. Especially if you, if you didn't get it at all yet. What Jesus did for you on the cross. And the consequences are disastrous. The fact that Jesus breaks out in tears, it's an urgent warning. But also it shows the heart of Jesus. It gives me also the question, is my heart as broken for the lost 
as Jesus' heart is broken. And I think it also gives an urgency in our prayers, especially for the, for the Jewish people, for whom Jesus' heart is broken here in the first place, right? You know, the Apostle Paul, he writes it in, in 1 Corinthians. We, pre we preach Christ, the Messiah, crucified. A stumbling block to Jews, to the Jewish people. And a folly to the Gentiles. And that's heartbreaking. We saw Jesus, how Jesus willed about it. But, thank God for the buts in Scripture. Thank God there is a but. You know, they are always so beautiful in the Scripture. Think about, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. So also here, in, when Paul says that, the cross is a stumbling block, it, there is a but. But. There's a but to the great tragedy, thankfully. Messiah crucified is a, is a stumbling block it's hidden for the eyes of many, but to those who are called, both Jews, both Jewish people and Greeks, non-Jewish people, there are those who are called. There are those who hear the message of the cross and by, get, by God's grace, get it. And, and I think I can, pray, we can, we can praise God for a lot of you that we got it. It's the mercy of God that the gospel call to faith was, was effective in us. Thank God for this, for this but. They're both Jewish people and tons of non-Jewish people who are, who are getting it. Also among the Jewish people today there is a remnant. As the Apostle Paul says it, according to the election of grace, people who, who get the cross. Or maybe it's even better to say the message of the cross gets us. We start to understand and we, and we keep growing in that understanding. That the cross of Jesus is actually the power of God and the wisdom of God. That's the but. To, to the tragedy. That's thankfully there too. And then also, especially when we think about Jerusalem, we still have to add, there's also an until to this tragedy which made Jesus weep. You know, a few chapters earlier in, in Luke, chapter 13, Jesus says, it's again a lament. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings? And you would not. And then he continues. First, talking about the tragedy again. Behold, your house is forsaken. Yes, Jerusalem was destroyed. And I tell you, you will not see me. But then there is an until. And let's underline that. Until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You see the promise here? The tragedy that, Jesus, that Jerusalem is not getting it will not last forever. There is an until. God said it through the, through the prophet Zechariah. I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem 
a spirit of grace and of, and of supplication, so that they will look on me, whom they pierced. And, mourn for, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. There is a day coming when the people of Jerusalem will recognize the crucified Messiah. And then we actually also read it in, in, in the prophecies of Zechariah. In that day a fountain will be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. For sin and impurity. Because in that day Jerusalem will know what is for their peace. Then the, the confession of Isaiah 53 will be Israel's confession. Israel will get it. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that gives us peace was upon him. Yeah, and then there will be a real triumphal entry that will not end in weeping. It's interesting, actually. You know, when Jesus entered Jerusalem that first time, there's first this great excitement. And then Jesus weeping. But when he will come the second time, yes, then there will be weeping too. First, the weeping of repentance and, and recognition that they were wrong about Jesus. But then, it will turn into this limitless peace. It will really come what the disciples were so excited about. And then the people will say it again. Now with the full recognition of who, of who Jesus is. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Recognizing what made for their peace. That the punishment of our peace was upon him. Now in that light, like so, about this, on the one hand this tragedy, but also this, uh, this, this but, that there, is, there are people, that there are Jewish people who, who see it. And, and waiting for this, this until, we, we also can do our, our ministry in, in Brooklyn. And, and so I was thinking like, okay, just 10 minutes or so to, to share something quick 